make sure you all go on to YouTube, Facebook, and subscribe and turn on your notifications. We go live almost every single Thursday. So turn that notification bell on so you can see when we go live and share to all your friends, especially if they don't have Facebook. Yeah, so this is our YouTube channel. So I'm Dr. Natalie Phillips, and obviously this is not Dr. Hannah Galloway, no. but we are here. Um, Haley was actually a... Um, um, we were able to get her back for a few months. And so she's here. Dr. Galloway is out this week and next week. And so we have prepared a great topic for you guys. Um, but again, just kind of pulling up our YouTube, we want to make sure that you know that we do have a YouTube that you can subscribe to, turn on your notifications. But on the YouTube, what's really cool is that we have all of our previous All Things Odd shows kind of categorized into, you know, different categories like music and musicians, technology, better speech and hearing month hearing protection, research spotlights, philanthropy. If you want to watch all of them, they're right here on All Things Odd. And so basically, you know, um, go ahead and um, hit that subscribe button. Share it with people who don't have Facebook because we are live on Facebook and then also YouTube right now. And then we put it over into Instagram. And so um, you can always watch it there. But if people that you know that you want to share, like, oh my gosh, this is a great topic, um, you can share it the YouTube link with them. So that's really kind Kind of nice because um you know that way they don't have to necessarily be part of social media okay so today what we're going to talk about is if you've seen kind of um, what we wrote out is we're talking about flexibility as an audiologist and this kind of came up um, with Haley and I this week as we saw patients because we had noticed that there are some what we as professionals can call maybe difficult to test patients, not in a bad way, but just basically saying that we need more time, right? Or we need to pivot or we need to do something different to try to get results. And so what we're talking about today is um, how to be flexible as an audiologist. So working with your patients. And so if you're joining us for the first time, we love to take comments, come say hi to us. But then also, if you have something to add in your professional watching, like tell us some of your tricks and trades and some of the things that other people might be able to benefit from as well. So with that, we are going to start with our first question that I'll talk about in when I said, you know, this difficult to test patient, it's not anything bad. But basically, again, we're looking at patients that might take us a little bit longer, or in the middle of a particular appointment, like we're going to have to do something different quickly to try to get some results, right? So that's what we're talking about. So some of the patients that we had um, talked about that we wanted to share would be pediatric patients, right? Depending on their age, there are different ways that we can actually test kids um, depending on what they can do. So sometimes it's not just the typical, like press the button, raise your hand when you hear the beep, but we use toys, we use different task oriented um, uh, audiology that, you know, when we train them to hear something, they put a, uh, something on a pegboard. Um, I know that people have used bean bags to toss it in a basket. There's a thing called troca, um, which is a tangible reinforcement thing where there's a machine that if you hear something and push the machine, it actually gives you either a sticker or a prize or back Back in the day when we were able to um, <laughs> enjoy snacks together, a goldfish would come out. You know, it's called troca. Um, so that's with pediatric or kiddos. Other difficult to test um, populations would be people that are nonverbal, like they can't tell you, right, um, that they hear something. They have a hard time even being able to push the button. Um, so sometimes, again, developmental disability patients, people like that, that might have a hard time. Um, <laughs> and then we have your typical geriatric patients. Sometimes they need um, reinstruction multiple times. So you've got different um, people that might have memory issues. We deal with a lot of brain injury and concussion patients. And so again, different ways that you can explain what you need to get done and to get the hearing tests done um, or the hearing test done. Also, we have non-compliant teenagers. Hmm. Uh, what do you know? <laughs> so maybe they are just like, they don't want to be there, right? Um, or maybe it is a, a malingerer, right? Maybe it is um, somebody calling for attention or they want to... Um, uh, kind of pretend that they have a hearing loss in order to get some benefits. And so there's malingerers as well. Um, and then we have one other population that we wanted to talk about too, which is um, hidden hearing loss. And that would be auditory processing disorders where they might come in and say, you know what, um, 
I just have a hard time hearing a noise. I do fine with everybody else, but the minute I get into a noisy situation, um, I have a really hard time understanding um, people talk. Like I'm just too focused on multiple conversations all the time. Like I can't decipher anything, you know? And so you put them in the booth and do the hearing test and it shows that they have normal hearing. Well, that might not be the case, right? So this hidden hearing loss, even though it shows normal hearing, might actually have a hearing loss, um, which is called an auditory processing disorder, where it doesn't show up on the hearing test, but it might show up when we do a different type of test for auditory processing. So those are just some of the different things that we've been seeing that might be more of this like difficult to test population. Okay, and then I'm going to have um, Haley talk a little bit more about some of the different tests. So besides the typical audiogram or hearing test where you push the button, you repeat words back, there are other tests that we can do in the middle of our testing that we might not be getting results for that we can easily go into um, if we need to. So Haley, I'm going to have you talk about some of the different tests that we use to obtain the data. So there's lots of different tests we can use. Um, for us to start off, uh, we can use those speech tests. So that includes um, SRTs or SATs, depending on the age of the kid or adult. So we are trying to um, see how low they can hear our speech. So speech reception threshold is SRT yep. and SAT is speech awareness threshold. Mm -hmm. So with SRT, we are actually looking for them to respond back. That could be pointing to a picture. Um, that could be them assigning that could be them saying the word back. So it's mm -hmm. going to kind of depend on the patient. Whereas uh, speech awareness threshold, we are looking to see are they turning their head or having some sort of behavioral response um, when they hear that sound? And is it time locked? Mm -hmm. So we're kind of comparing those, looking at it. Sometimes we even give instructions to see can they hear the instructions at that low level, trying to see the lowest level they can hear. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we can also do word recognition. So we present words and see, hey, if it's loud enough, how many are they getting quick? So um, that can be presented either monitored live voice or it can also be recorded. Sometimes patients don't do well with recorded if they have attention problems. So what Haley's talking about too is speech testing. Sometimes we might start off with tones, right? And we're like, mm -hmm. I don't know if they can hear the tone because... I was just sitting out here talking to them and they're not responding to these tones and we've re-instructed mm -hmm. them multiple times. So when Haley's talking about doing speech testing, yes, that's part of our normal battery of mm -hmm. tests and our typical audiogram. However, sometimes we will switch, we'll be flexible, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about today is we'll be flexible and go, um, we're going to switch over to speech because people respond better to speech. And sometimes mm -hmm. if you're catching a malingerer or somebody who's not being truthful about their mm -hmm. hearing or exaggerating their thresholds, we can usually catch them better with speech testing because mm -hmm. it's a two-syllable word that they have to respond back to. Um, and so there, again, there's a lot of different tricks that you can mm -hmm. do with that, but that's what she's talking about. Yes, speech testing is part of our normal battery, mm -hmm. but sometimes we'll just take her, them away from tones for a second, go over to speech real quick, get your threshold for speech. So that way, when we know exactly when we come back to tones, mm, you should be able to hear all of these tones, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so speech testing is one. What's another, what's a couple of other tests that we can do? Um, so we can also do OAEs, which are autoacoustic emissions. So an OAE puts a sound into the ear and it travels all the way up through the outer middle into the inner ear and it actually reflects a response back. Mm -hmm. So there is a microphone that's basically picking up that response and we're trying to see, are we getting that reflection back or is there something along that pathway that is causing a disruption and therefore, we're not getting that response. So we know, hey, something's going on somewhere between outer ear to um, inner yeah. ear. Yeah. Um, it does not tell us, though, past the inner ear. So mm -hmm. if there's something going on in that nerve or even up to the brain, the OAE won't tell us that. Um, there's pros and cons to this. The nice thing, the patient doesn't have to respond. Mm -hmm. But if you have a very hyperactive uh, patient that's very loud, Getting them quiet and still so mm -hmm. that it stays in their ear can sometimes be a little tricky. 
Yeah. So autoacoustic emissions are kind of like even like if you looked at a piano keyboard and I mm -hmm. pushed two keys down, you're looking for that other key to pop up basically. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's distortion product autoacoustic emissions. And yes, the nice thing is you don't have to have the patient respond at all because it's a response that naturally happens if they mm -hmm. have it there. Um, but the noise floor does have to go down. So the patient has to be pretty quiet and pretty cooperative as mm -hmm. well. Right. Um, and we'll talk about some other um, uh, patients that we've seen where sometimes that can get difficult. Okay. And then the last um, test that we thought about that you can do. Um, so this is um, either ASSR, which is auditory steady state response, or ABR, which is auditory brainstem response. Mm -hmm. So with both of these tests, we are actually looking at waveforms to try and find their threshold. And this can be done in different ways, depending on how you set up your test. Okay. Um, so the nice thing, again, they don't have to respond um because we're just looking at those waveforms and we can figure out is it conductive or sensory neural and where is that problem kind of happening um downside is that patient has to be cooperative again mm -hmm. um there are clinics though that do do sedated assrs mm -hmm. or abrs um so that if the patient will not cooperate you can still figure out roughly their thresholds mm -hmm. from these tests they just have to be sedated Yep. And so with an ABR, it tells you it's a click. And so it tells you like a certain high frequency unless that clinic does what they call tone burst ABRs. Um, however, it takes a long time. So yeah. ASSRs came along where you can actually gain four frequencies on each ear mm -hmm. at the same time, um, which is really kind of cool because you can kind of walk away with a pretty good idea of where their audiogram mm -hmm. is and where their thresholds are by doing ASSRs. Yeah. And so that's a great way um, to pivot if you cannot get your typical responses in a booth. Yeah. Okay, so then we're going to talk a little bit more about some different tricks or what we want to call strategies to obtain the data. So again, some of the strategies that we talked about are re-instructions. We talked about um, playing with the toys, especially with kids. Like we actually have spondy toys. So we have mm -hmm. a basket where we're like, show me the baseball, show me the mm -hmm. airplane, show me the toothbrush, you know, um, and show me the ice cream, the hot dog. And so they're already um, speech-weighted words but it took us a long time to find these toys, like buying huge bins <laughs> and throwing them all out till we found the actual Spondy toy, but super helpful. And um, we have that basket of Spondy toys um, that we can use. Then we've also um, done like for nonverbal patients we had talked about, sometimes we ask them instead of like pushing the button or raising your hand, um, sometimes we say, hey, blink every time you hear something or squeeze um, this person's hand every time you, you know, so we're looking for a behavioral response and it might not necessarily be pushing that button or raising your hand. So it's a blink or it's a squeeze of the hand. Um, if there's any response there, sometimes we just have to go slower. Mm -hmm. I work very fast. So it's hard for me to slow down, but at the same time, if you want to get your responses, right. And you want to give that patient, especially with some of the um, populations that we talked about, to go slower and to recheck uh, multiple times, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then if all else fails, obviously our answer is going to what Haley talked about, possibly sending to a clinic that does sedation to just get mm -hmm. everything worked out and just get the audiogram, depending on how quickly we need to work. So for example, with kids, we're trying to identify, you know, hearing loss. And so sometimes it's easier to get them sedated and get it done because we want to make sure that if we can identify a child with hearing loss, it has to be before six months of age, mm -hmm. right? To get those hearing aids on, actually the hearing aids should be fit before six months of age. <laughs> and so depending on the timeline, um, you might have to go straight to ASSRs in a clinic that does mm -hmm. sedation. Or sometimes it can just be, okay, you know, if the parental concern or if there's not much of a concern for hearing loss, let's continue to do multiple appointments and just piece together the hearing test every time they come back. So that's another option as well um, is another trick. And then um, uh, another strategy, I should say strategy. Another strategy <laughs> is sometimes I will go through my microphone and ask them at a very low level if they can hear me OK. And then if they say yes, you know, they heard even if they say no, they can't hear you 
they heard you because they heard you ask that question. Mm -hmm. um, and then I know at that level, they should be hearing me at that level or a little bit lower than that. So mm -hmm. that's a strategy. Um, we talked about starting with speech. And then we also talked about some of these other tests like photoacoustic emissions and reflexes that will give us a general idea or starting point. Um, okay. So then what we're going to do is we're going to actually talk about some recent experiences that we had. So I wanted Haley to talk about a recent experience when she was nannying. She actually mm -hmm. went to to an appointment. So talk to us and share um, about that one particular appointment that you're in. Yeah, so I actually did get an opportunity to go with this child. Um, she is six years old uh, to her audiologic evaluation. Um, she has both Down syndrome and autism. So it makes it a little challenging. Um, and they have been trying to collect information on her hearing since she was born and they've had to put pieces together little mm -hmm. by little so sometimes you can't get it all at the same time and you kind of have to build from previous appointments um so it's kind of cool because we put her into the booth and they of course started with speech testing just to see you know where is she coming in where is she aware of speech um and we told the audiologist her favorite song which was old mcdonald so we were able to do that and the audiologist could go through the mic talk to her and she will respond to it mm. and she has her favorite uh sounds so you would ah. say her favorite sounds she really liked a cat um or a bow wow for dog so those were some of her favorites and we told the audiologist this so that when audiologist said meow meow she was like meow meow she would sing along with the song. And so we were also getting her to respond, but she was also aware. So it's kind mm -hmm, of a combination mm -hmm. of awareness and responses. Mm -hmm. um, and then the beeps were really hard for her. She did do a couple, um, but then she just became exhausted. So the audiologist switched over to OEEs. Well, she doesn't like things in her ears and she was just talking and singing and moving and so uh, I basically held her hands because um, she it kind of calms down her nervous system. Um, and I signed Old McDonald to her. So she really enjoys the signs. Um, a lot of her language is through sign language. Mm -hmm. um, so that distracted her enough to where she was able to stay quiet. Um, the audiologist tried toys in the office. She had no interest, mm. no interest in any of the toys in the office. Um, some of them too weren't necessarily safe for her mm -hmm. because she would put them in her mouth or she could bite off a piece of it, something along those lines. So we had to use music. She loves music. And so we did that with sign language. Oh, I love that. So <laughs> as you can see, that was a patient that um, if you're just joining in and missed it too, it was a patient that had Down syndrome and autism. And with one patient, this audiologist had to be very flexible mm -hmm. in multiple ways, right? And so before when we were talking about spondee words and playing with toys, picking out the toy, mm -hmm. right? The baseball, the hot dog, the ice cream, she wasn't interested in toys, right? Then sometimes um, we have to, especially as a six-year-old, um, and developmentally disabled, you know, there might be, they might be back a couple of years in mm -hmm. their developmental process, right? Yeah. So sometimes we um, take the earphones out, especially if they don't like it, yeah. and then we call them from one side of the booth using the speaker. But if you were just to call them, like usually I'll call their name, wave, uh, uh, have them um, look up when they look over, I um, stimulate with um, what we call uh, some of our toys in there. They light up and it's called visual reinforcement audiometry. But with speech, we're like, hey, so and so, look over here. And if they mm -hmm. look, then I light up a toy. Mm -hmm. However, if she wasn't even interested in that, I love the ability of that audiologist to be flexible enough to say, okay, so we know her favorite song. Let's sing it to her, right? At least to get mm -hmm. speech awareness. That's all you're working on. So, so for those of you who are like, but those are not spondee words, it's fine. It's, it's speech <laughs> awareness, right? Mm -hmm. And you're getting the level at where she's able to respond, whether yeah. you're singing the song or whether you're making the noises of the animals mm -hmm. that are in that song, right? You, they yeah. got her to look over to get a speech awareness threshold. Then when they switched over to OAEs, you can't mm -hmm. sing because it's no. you're right because it's too loud. <laughs> we just said that um, motor acoustic emissions, you have to be quiet and the patient mm -hmm. has to be quiet. So being able to sign 
that mm -hmm. song. It's quiet and all she's doing is watching, right? Mm -hmm. And she's so engaged that she's not paying attention. You can easily get your autoacoustic emissions because it's soft. Mm -hmm. So when Haley shared that with me, I thought it was really kind of cool to see how that particular audiologist was able to pivot and be flexible with the same patient doing different things in the same appointment, right? And so we're talking about this because we want to make sure that uh, for a couple of things, if you're a professional watching, say, oh, that's super cool. Let me um, do that as well, right? Um, and again, we're all learning together. It wasn't anything that I did, but I even learned from that story. Or if you're a patient and you're like, oh, we just had a hard time or I heard about this hard time that this patient or this, um, my friend or my family member, you know, had, um, seek those audiologists that might be a little bit more flexible, right? And so, so it goes kind of both ways. Okay. So then we always have takeaways. And so we have takeaway one, um, basically um, to show that train your front desk, right? To make mm -hmm. an appointment. So I was trying to figure out, okay, what can we do um, to have people learn about how can we all be better at being flexible, right? Mm -hmm. So we spent time talking to our own front desk saying, okay, well, what would you say? What, how do you know whether or not you should um, spend more time with that patient? So our own front desk gave us these mm -hmm. responses. And again, if you're watching this and you have other suggestions um, for front desk or for offices, um, then put it in the comments um, wherever you're watching it because it's going to be helpful. But the takeaway one is train your front desk when making an appointment to ask the appropriate questions. Now, kind of have to be careful, like Haley and I talked about, it, and then we ran it by our front desk to make sure that, hey, would you ask this question? Or like, how would you put it? So it was interesting because our front desk brought up other issues too. They basically mm -hmm. said, well, typically when they're making the appointment, they can tell by just talking to the person on the phone um, if they need more time. And I said, how do you know? And she goes, well, if the patient is asking a lot of questions and they're just <laughs> scheduling the appointment, but they've got a million questions, she gives us another 10, 15 minutes because she thinks that by the time they get in, they'll probably have a lot of questions for us. And then also she says that um, if somebody else is scheduling for the patient, like a caregiver, a parent, um, a, a spouse, you know, um, then she kind of can tell if they might, if the patient might need a little bit extra time, depending on who's scheduling the appointment as well. So I thought those two things were really um, important. And then I said, now, how would you word it if you actually have to ask somebody, <laughs> right? If they would need more time, because you don't want to assume, but you also should probably ask. And this was her words verbatim. I wrote it down so that we could say it. Um, but she just basically asked, are there any special circumstances that are needed to schedule more time for your appointment? That's it. Right. And then allow them to say, yes or no. Right. And, and, oh, maybe, you know, like I might have a lot of questions for the audiologist or whatever it is, but that's how she would word it. So are there any special circumstances that are needed to schedule more time for your appointment? That's it. Okay. Keep it pretty simple. So that might be something that you add into your front desk um, intake or the phone call, um, you know, script or whatever, um, just to make sure, but that's a great way to do it. And then our other takeaway is obviously, uh, we've <laughs> talked about this, but find an audiologist or here, professional that is flexible. And this is what we're talking about, right? Like there is some way of thinking out of the box. It is kind of thinking out of the box, but it's basically being flexible in when you're seeing patients. So hopefully this um, brought up some great ideas. This brought up some great um, discussions within your own offices, um, discussions if you're a patient seeking somebody as well. But if you, like any time um, what we do a show, if you've got any suggestions at all, in, um, in addition to what we presented to you, please come back and comment because we want to make sure that people learn from this as well. So with that, <laughs> thanks for another um, great episode and for tuning in, share it out to your friends, follow us on YouTube, and we will see you um, when uh, we're here next week, yeah. next week at 1230 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So we'll see you then. Bye.